topic, we've got uh, sulfur fertility as our discussion point. Uh, we've had a handful of questions come in uh, and to help facilitate the discussion today, uh, we've got Jeff Betch and Dan Kaiser on. Uh, and before we get started, I just do want to highlight uh, next week's topic. Uh, we'll be talking weed management for 2022. Uh, with that, I do want to call out and recognize our sponsors for this morning, both the Minnesota Soybean and Corn uh, Research and Promotion Councils were both uh, instrumental in kind of help facilitate uh, this program. So with that, uh, we're going to get started. Uh, and we kind of decided, uh, Jeff, that uh, you would kind of lead things off and kind of look back at some of the work that uh, was initially done with sulfur uh, research uh, in, in nutrient management there. So Jeff's got some slides and he's gonna kind of set the stage uh, for us with some of our discussion today. And so after he's done, Dan is gonna have a few words and then uh, we'll move into the questions and answers section. All right. So uh, Dan and I were talking about this with Ryan last week on kind of a, a pre what we were gonna talk about. And I said, well, we're gonna, I'm gonna talk about the 25 years we've been doing sulfur research. And then I went back and did the math and it's wrong. It's only 23 years. We started our first project in 1999. I was thinking it was or 19, yeah, 1999. I was thinking it was earlier than that, but, but yeah, we started working with sulfur at uh, here at Wasika uh, quite a while ago, and I'm going to review a little bit of that uh, first material. But first, sulfur fertilization of corn in Minnesota. The old data um, from the 80s and 90s, sulfur was really only needed on low soil organic matter soils, primarily coarse textured sandy soils. Um, and that was pretty much our recommendation system. So what changed? Why do we need uh, sulfur? Why did we need sulfur? What changed that we needed sulfur on these medium and fine higher organic matter soils? Well, we think, we think it's a few things. We've thrown around the idea that it's higher corn yields. We've had the idea Certainly there's less sulfur impurities in some of our fertilizers, phosphorus fertilizers contain some, but the huge change is in sulfur deposition. The acid rain program started with the Clean Water Act in 1990, and then the cross state air pollution rule was implemented in 2015. And the chart on the right shows the sulfur dioxide emissions that were, and how they were affected by these rules. The first one over here is 1980, and we have about 17 million tons of sulfur dioxide emissions from coal power plants, primarily, or fossil fuel powered plants. By 1990, it was still about 16, just a little over 15 million tons, but that's when this clean, first clean water art program went into play. And by 95, it was down to 12, million tons. It stayed fairly steady until 2005, was down to about 10 million tons. And that's when this next rule started to become implemented. It wasn't put in place until 2015, but it's likely that many of these power plants put their scrubbers in sometime prior to that to make sure that they were in compliance once the rule went into effect. And you can see the reduction by, 20, by 2010, we were down to five tons. Now in 2015, we're under their goal or their standard. And now both plans are in place and they're down around two and a half to two tons. And the last measurement that was in this report, they're, they're down less than a ton of emissions or a, ton, a million tons of emissions of sulfur dioxide from these facilities. So that's been the huge change. And also the diesel fuel or removing sulfur and going to low low sulfur diesel fuel with all the thousands of semi trucks that were on the road. And later on with some of the agriculture tractors that has come has uh, certainly impacted it as well. So I believe it's pretty safe to say that the sulfur deposition reduction is the big factor. So some of our early sulfur studies, um, the first one was we did at Wasika was started initiated in 98 and the first year it was in corn was 1999. And this was actually a lime study and we had gypsum and calcium chloride as two treatments just to see if there was a calcium effect. Um, and gypsum is calcium sulfate, so it's a neutral salt. It doesn't affect pH, but it has calcium and also has, has sulfur or sulfate. And calcium chloride also has calcium. So what we found in that initial study over six years of corn is the treatments that got no sulfur yielded 177 and the treatments with gypsum yielded 183. It wasn't a big yield difference. It wasn't significant in every year, but 
it was consistent or fairly consistent and it was uh, sizable over that period. And it was starting to, to re us to recognize the differences of treating with sulfur and, and without. And it's about that same time that Giles started a study in 2004, where we looked at N, P, K, and S fluid fertilizers in either two by zero or two by two bands. And the two by two is the standard old uh, you know, practice, but the two by zero was dribbling it on the soil surface a couple inches from the row and not having to have all that uh, iron hanging on the planter. We had uh, different rates of N, P205, K20, and sulfur in pounds per acre. We had a control. We had 20 pounds of N, 20 pounds of phosphate, six pounds of K, and four. And we had one without the, without the potassium and one without the sulfur. We used ammonium polyphosphate, UAN, potassium thiosulfate, ammonium thiosulfate, and 7217 in combinations to get these treatments. And then we also had one where we upped the, treat, up, up the amount of K2O and sulfur. The first year, 2004, we saw that we got about a 10 bushel yield response just to adding the starter, just the 10, the 2026 versus the control. But we got about five to six bushels where we had sulfur at four pounds per acre included into that uh, salt earths, uh, that starter mix. Now that alone was not enough to get a significant difference. But when you compared it across these different treatments and the sources, it did make a difference. Then when we upped it to 10 pounds, we went up yield about another seven or eight bushels. And this number was significantly greater than the treatments or than the UAN and 721.7. In 2005, it was a poor yielding year for corn. We saw no significant differences. In 2006, it was a very good yielding year. We had 209 with the control. The UAN and the 7217 really didn't give us a yield advantage. There was no advantage to the starter effect of the of the UA or the nitrogen, the phosphorus, and the potassium. But any of the treatments that had sulfur had anywhere from 15 to 18 bushel advantage over the non-sulfur containing treatments. And that was kind of a, a pretty significant number. And that was one of our first larger responses in that in these early studies. And here shows the yield responses over time. Not much effect to the starter treatment alone, just a couple bushels, um, four or five, six bushels more when we had the low rate of sulfur, and then maybe an extra four or five when we went to the up to 10 pounds of sulfur. So the next study we did was the 2010 sulfur source study on a Nicollet Webster soil here at Waseca. And this was kind of the game changer. This is where we really, kind of opened our eyes to what we could see from a sulfur response on these heavy soils. We had a control treatment. It yielded 181. This was in continuous corn, had 21% grain moisture. This corn looked good. We were happy with that. We added APP or 1034-0 and furrow at four gallons per acre. No real difference. We added one gallon of ATS two to four gallons of APP kept it in furrow and we saw yields trending upward and soil mo or grain moisture trending downward, but not a big difference. We upped that one gallon to two gallons or 5.6 pounds of sulfur, but now we had to keep it separate. We had to put the, in, the 1030 furrow in furrow and the sulfur, the ATS had to go in a surface band because it was just too hot to be in with the seed. And this is where we saw a significant yield increase. Now we went up from from the APP alone, we went up 22 bushels and we do reduce grain moisture 3%. We had broadcast incorporated treatments that were applied pre-plant. We had AMS and gypsum. And in this table, I've just averaged these across the 10 and 20 pound rates because they were very similar individually, either AMS or gypsum. They both provide sulfate and we had already balanced for the nitrogen that was in there. But the 10 pound rates, um, a pre-plan applied either AMS or gypsum. We got 210 bushels and very low grain moisture. We went to 20 pounds. We went up to 226 bushels, a 45 bushel yield increase from the control, a five percentage point reduction in grain moisture. So we're looking at like a, even at $4 corn, we're looking at $180 return on investment for something that cost maybe $10 or $8.
We also applied gypsum as a top dress at V5 at 10 and 20 pounds. Got similar responses, except for the grain moisture was a little bit greater than it was where we put it on broadcast. I think what we did is we just, we starved that corn for sulfur a little bit longer and slowed its growth down, but it still yielded just fine, but it slowed its maturation until it got that sulfur at a later date. And we also put ATS on as an injected side dress at V5. That wasn't quite as effective at 10 pounds as these broadcast gypsum treatments. We did the study again in 2011 after being so excited about 2010 and what we found, no significant differences in yield. And that was interesting. Um, all these sites, all these fields that really had not been applied, had not had sulfur fertilizer applied in the past. Um, so we were a little surprised that we got no response in 2011 after a very large response in 2010. We did the same study, but with just a few different treatments in 2012. And over here on the right, we had AMS, gypsum, and elemental sulfur, kind of as Tiger 90 pastilles. We applied it either in the fall or in the spring in pre -plant or incorporated, and we had 10 pounds or 20 pounds. So in the 2012 year, the gypsum and the AMS, where the sulfur was in the sulfate form, were better than elemental. The rate really didn't, the timing, um, fall was probably superior to spring and the rate didn't matter. But really what it came down to is we go over here to this chart and the yellow bars are the yields. The control yielded have been about 180. Ammonium polyphosphate or 1034 alone gave us about a 15 bushel yield increase. Ammonium polyphosphate with a 10 pounds of sulfur as ATS or three and a, about three and a half gallons gave us another nice yield increase and probably one of our highest yielding treatments. And then we have AMS in the fall, gypsum in the fall, elemental in the fall, AMS in the spring, gypsum in the spring, and elemental in the spring. And what you see is what's going on over here with the rate and the timing is really just related to the elemental in the spring. In that warm spring with normal precip with a dry summer, that elemental sulfur just did not oxidize in time if it was applied in the spring and it was inferior. The lines are graphed on this, or the dots on the lines are graphed on this other Y axis, and that's the ear leaf sulfur concentration at R1. And you could see how that elemental sulfur applied in the spring had ear leaf sulfur that wasn't a lot different than the control. And you can also see how these fall treatments seem to be better than the spring treatments, but this gypsum applied at V6 did really well. We ran a very similar study with the same treatments in 2013. And this was a different year. This year was cold in the spring with much greater than normal precip. And what did we see? We saw that some of these fall treatments, especially the sulf AMS in the fall, did not do as well as they had the previous year and the spring treatments did better. And the elemental treatments actually didn't do too bad either in the, when it was applied in the fall. And I think this gets at, if it's applied in the fall and it's a really wet year, it's potentially the sulfate can move with water and maybe we leach some a little bit deeper in the profile and it reduced the effect of the sulfur concentration on those ear leaves just a little bit. And it also reduced yield just a little bit compared to some of these treatments that were applied in the spring. And the other thing that we learned from that second year is even though we 10 pounds was usually adequate. Um, we did have a yield response to, to the 20 pound rate in that wet year, but it was a pretty small yield response, about four bushels. So that's what we've learned in the early years of our sulfur fertilizer research, um, both at Wasika, and we moved on and did studies in Rochester and in, in Lamberton and across Southeast Minnesota. But with that, I'm gonna stop and let Dan kind of talk about some of the things that he's worked on from that point forward or throughout his career here in Minnesota. And I do wanna recognize the funding for this research was provided by the Fluid Fertilizer Foundation, Industry Gifts, AFREC, and the University of Minnesota. Back to you, Ryan. All right, Dan, did you wanna make a few comments before we started taking questions? No, why don't we move over and I'll just, I've got a couple comments here, yeah, on some of the stuff that we've been looking at. So here, let me share my screen.
So I've been here in Minnesota for about 13 years. Um, that's one of the things coming in. I didn't really expect to do a lot of research on sulfur. Um, I came in expecting to be looking more at placement um, of P and K and, and those types of things. But it's something that I got involved with early on um, back in 2008. It's been a, probably um, about a third to a half of my research that I've had moving um forward from that time period. So I'm just going to talk a little bit about, as Jeff did, kind of what the things I've seen in the 13 years that I've been doing uh, sulfur research here in Minnesota. So one thing that I've done is um, with a lot of this data, we have updated the, <clears throat> the guidelines. Um, so if you kind of look at um, where we're at now, the initial updates were fairly simple. We had look, we're looking at crop rotation and soil organic matter concentration, um, which has been important in our medium to fine textured soils because the soil test for sulfur, it really doesn't work or really doesn't work at all. I mean, I look at the, the sites that we have and if you look at a responsive and non-responsive sites, there isn't a whole lot of difference in the, the sulfate soil test, uh, no matter what test you're running because the labs in the state, if you look at across um, all the labs, there's differences in what the labs are running um, in terms of a test. And none of them really, I would say, I, I put a whole lot of stock into because what we've seen is organic matter has been the best option. If you're looking at trying to gauge overall availability, it isn't perfect because we know that um, some of the, the soils in the Southeast, even with lower organic matter, they can mineralize um, more nitrogen and, and sulfate. So it doesn't always work perfectly, but it's been you know better than um, looking at uh, some of the data we've had from the, the sulfur soil test itself. The main change in the updated ones in 2020 is uh, right here. Uh, we did put in some recommendations for poor drainage for medium and fine textured soils, increasing um, what I recommend for application rates prior to corn. Now, there's been some work going on. It's, it's some of the stuff we've been doing, looking at rotational issues, um, looking at following up with soybean years behind these corn years. And we have seen, particularly in fields in the Southeast, that you know 20 to 25 pounds, uh, we see that benefit the corn year one and then carry through and benefit the soybean year two. So, it's something that, you know, when I look at what I recommend for crops right now, corn has been in alfalfa have been the two targets, but um, we do know that there can be some carryover impact that you may want to, you know, affect. And that's, it's one of the things, if you're really looking at a very low rate, do you have a low organic matter situation? Um, it's why I recommend more with these low organic matters for some of that carryover impact into the, the following year. So this was back, um, just kind of going back to 2009, uh, one of our more striking fields. Um, this was over in Renville County. This is a high organic matter continuous corn. You can kind of see right here, this nice little postage stamp, which was our research trial within that field. You can see the, the three, at least three of the four check plots with no sulfur in that. And this is one of the things that really got me thinking on some of the crop rotational issues, particularly continuous corn. Although I think some of this issue, it's, it's, stems back to some of what we're looking at now and looking at um, how our soil chemistry can impact the sulfur availability, because these are also an area with high pH in this low area of the field. And we've been seeing consistent striping um, early in the season with some of those situations. And that's kind of why I modified some of my guidelines to suggest some sulfur application, just because these growers have been continually doing it and seeing um, some good effects from sulfur application. Um, we'll go forward here. This is another field in 20, let's see that, another field in 2019. This is side by side where we're doing some um, two by two banded um, sulfur with the planter. You can see kind of here on the left, this is the no sulfur versus the sulfur. This was uh, just uh, southeast of Albert Lee. Um, so pretty close to the Iowa border. Uh, roted knobs or knolls within the field are pretty significant in terms of a yield response. And again, this is kind of the, the primary starting point to a lot of our guidelines. So with sulfur, there's some considerations. I mean, there's a lot of flexibility we've seen in terms of options. I um, mean, source is probably the biggest one right now. And that's my, really the, the core of a lot of the research I'm doing right now is looking at different sources, particularly elemental sources to see how well they oxidize and become available because that's one of the major questions. And a lot of growers have been relying on elemental, particularly for fall applications. Um, and just looking at the various options, because there are differences in the options and how they become available. A uh, crop response, again, corn and alfalfa. I'll show you some of the data with the, the recent data we've had. I mean, we're pretty positive with those two. Soybean, it's been hit or miss. 
And I think soybean for direct applications, reduced till is probably the key with low organic matter if you're going to see a response. But what I've really been stressing to a lot of growers, if you're in that situation, just um, put a little extra on ahead of the corn because we see some nice carryover. And I actually see where that's benefited beans more than anything um, itself. Uh, rate, um, I'll talk a little bit about that. And then timing, uh, Jeff was showing some of the V5 versus pre-plant. And I've done a fair amount of that. And I can get max yield with um, an in-season application, particularly around V5. But Jeff is showing some differences in grain moisture. And that's typically the thing I see um, up through about V5, V6. I mean, I still can you know rescue the crop, but you may see a, a little bit of an uptick in grain moisture where it would have been better off having that sulfur on earlier in the growing season. So this is one of the current studies we're working on right now. Uh, this is a study funded through AFRIC. Um, we're looking at some different sources at different rates. I'm not gonna talk about the rates as much. Um, there was one of the sites where we were looking at five, 10 and 20 pounds that we saw a difference between the five and 10. Majority of sites, particularly Rosemont and Wasika, if you look at our data, this is just looking at 2021 data. And this is the three year average that, um, you know, Rosemont, the five pounds has typically been sufficient. It hasn't taken a whole lot for annual applications. And again, this is a we're repeated applications in the same plots every year, but uh, Wasika, you know, definitely a difference there. And we've been seeing a lot more stress at the Wasika location. You can see um, here the difference of the control versus our sulfur treatments are close to 60 bushels there. Um, Tiger 90 hasn't been performing as well. And that's one of the things that with that particular product, there's some issues with it, particularly if you incorporate it, um, because that product, um, elemental sulfur, is hydro, it's hydrophobic, so it repels water. So if you bury it, what tends to happen is in a tight soil, it just can't disperse. And that's one of the things that I've been really looking at options. And you now, Jeff, and then I, we've got some stuff laid out for some fall applications with Tiger 90 without incorporation, because that's one of the things we're kind of looking at, whether or not that would be a better option just to get that product dispersed. But seeing some interesting things here. I mean, what, you know, definitely the two locations, Becker, not as much, a sandy soil. That site though, if you look at the irrigation water, um, we're getting uh, roughly 60 to 70 pounds of sulfate with about 10 to 12 inches of water on that site. So, you know, we'll see striping early on, but overall um, the stress, you know, the sites where I've seen consistently with irrigation that we've had response have been situations where one, we haven't had to irrigate um, until later in the season or, you know, sandy locations without irrigation uh, definitely are something I would, con I would consider um, just because um, the irrigation water is, can be a significant component. So if you do have irrigation, it's one of the things that, you know, it might be interesting just to test um, the sulfate sulfur level in there if you can do it through the lab, if you're running nitrate already, just to see where your well values are at. This is just a picture from the, this year that Jeff took, just some comparisons of, you know, kind of the corn growth at Wasika. Um, this is one of the things that's been interesting to this site, seeing a lot of uh, nitrogen interaction with the sulfur. So we see a lot of nitrogen um, deficiency, particularly on the, on the plots without sulfur or the Tiger 90 plots. So we know it's starving itself for sulfur and that's impacting our nitrogen uptake or utilization. And we're just getting poor utilization of both at that site. I don't necessarily see that as much at Rosemont, as they do at um, Wasika, but it's been pretty clear. And that's why I think we're getting these, these 60 bushel yield reductions at that, that particular location. Alfalfa has been kind of a trickier issue. Uh, we know that we have recommendations for it, but getting some of these responses to occur hasn't been easy. Uh, this is just um, kind of a, a study that we've been doing. Um, we started with AFRIC funding back in 2020, looking at, um, this is 2020 to 2021, two cuttings. And I think then this here is the, the remaining three cuttings from 2021, looking at our differences in values. And you look at the, the sources, again, we're looking at K-sulfate, and this is KMST, which uh, this is a, a product where it's got finely ground sulfur that's incorporated into the granule. In this case, it's potash. So uh, this is something similar to you would see with a microessentials or something where they're, they're uh, finely grinding the sulfur and trying to look, um, to try to increase the availability by decreasing the concentration in a in each granule on a per granule basis and in this location seeing you know similar response we see increases in tonnage bases on the source then if you look at it the rate wise um, this particular site 10 pounds has been enough you look at it though in terms of return i was just playing around with this a little bit just looking at kind of average values i was pulling off in terms of dollars per ton you know not really factoring in quality on the alfalfa and this is looking at 50 cents a pound S, which is probably a little bit low right now. But even if you'd increase this up to about 80 cents a pound, 
you're still going to see a positive return on the repeated applications. And we're really seeing this in terms of we're getting multiple um, cuttings from the site. So very profitable. What I'm really recommending is a minimum of 10 pounds, particularly with eye production systems. Uh, you may need up to 20 to 25 pounds, particularly if you're getting into situations where you're getting organic matter concentrations in your soil to 3% or less. So kind of what we're seeing kind of backing up what we were doing in terms of the recommendations when I changed them for alfalfa a few years ago. So yeah, 10 pounds of sulfur returned roughly $228 per acre over the two years. So pretty sizable return on, on this given location. Say Dan, just to stop for a second, there was a question. Uh, they wanted a little clarification back on your corn slide. Uh, maybe what some of the differences or why there was a difference with the Wasika site as opposed to the Rosemont site. I mean, this is something we've been seeing, and it's, I think a lot of it has to do with sulfur availability. Uh, so if you look at the Rosemont site, it's interesting. We'll get a lot of uh, sulfur deficiency up through about V10, and this is corn on corn. So we'd expect more deficiencies with corn on corn. That's kind of what we've seen within the last 10, you know, well, at least I've seen back about the last 13 years. And it just seems like that site for some reason has, you know, it just whether or not it isn't mineralizing as much later on, um, the, the Rosemont site will tend to start to recover at V10 where we'll see it, the plants green up a little bit. They'll still yield less. But if you look at the difference in terms of the sulfur versus is no sulfur, we just don't see as much of a, a difference. And I think a lot of that's that, that um, mineralization that's occurring at about V10 or later from, that, um, from the organic matter in there. And it just doesn't seem to impact the nitrogen availability quite as much as we do at, at um, Wasika. And we've seen that with a lot of our continuous corn sites. We get really hammered on, um, when you look at nitrogen deficiency in a lot of these fields, and it doesn't seem like it can put on enough in some of these fields, even to maximize yield. So that's the thing that I've seen with these. There's something going on with nitrogen and sulfur that's more severe at, these Wasika, at the Wasika site, where you, know, you need to be more considerate of that, particularly for continuous corn. I mean, at least 10 pounds of sulfur, you know, if not more, on some of these heavier soils is kind of what I'd recommend um, just to get away from some of that yellowing of it. But it's a lot of it, I think, has to do with that interaction with that. I mean, we have been looking at some different uh, technologies. These are just some little ion probes that we use just to kind of measure um, sulfur availability. It's one of the technologies I'm using right now. And this, again, is to try to track that piece at looking at elemental sulfur and how it's oxidizing. So it's kind of some of the things we've been doing just to back up some of this data, just to see when it's releasing. And what we've been seeing with a lot of these probes is that with these, um, these micronized forms is that we're starting to see availability about a month in to the growing season. So we'll start these when we at planting, um, usually around uh, the early, you know, first, second week in May. And then um, we'll start seeing the concentrations of sulfate being released increase somewhere around, you know, early to mid June with it. So it does take a little while. Um, for, although again, if you factor in that we want to have sulfur available by V5, it's usually enough. So, you know, some things that I've learned, I guess I don't assume that I know everything. I thought I was done with sulfur around, you know, 2012 and 13. And here I am, you know, again, about half of my research is on sulfur. And then the carryover effect too is um, it does carry over from one year to the next, but it really depends on your field. But again, with soybean, I think this is the key. And um, it's the key because what I've seen with beans is that we've increased vegetative growth with sulfur being applied. So the problem when we run into that issue is that we can get disease issues that set in. So it seems to be better to me to, we, we could see it somewhere at least within a two foot depth with a soil sample post corn that, um, you know, just putting a little extra on ahead of the corn seemed to be a better option. But again, if you have like no-till, a reduced till situation with beans, you think they're um, short or they're yellowing. I mean, you could try something with a sulfur application just to see um, if that would increase it. But overall, it's, it's one they don't really get crazy about. Incidental applications too. This has been kind of the thing that we've run into. And in right around 2012 and 13, I was having an issue finding spots with sulf that were sulfur deficient. I think a lot of that's because a lot of growers were more cognizant of it and applying it more. And we're seeing this carryover impact from the fertilizer with uh, 20 to 25 pound rates that it was getting harder and harder to find sites. And now when the rainfall picked up, it started, I think, flush some of that out that we started to see it again, you know, 2015, 16, 17, 18 with some of the newer studies, but that's been kind of that carryover impact. The other thing is pea fertilizer sources. If you are applying MAP and DAP, say a removal rate of phosphate, you're probably applying about five pounds of available sulfur annually from that source. That's why I don't get too bent out of shape 
of 20 versus 25 pounds with applications because the more phosphate you apply, you can factor anywhere from one to 3% available S in that product that's not labeled. And the companies will not label that because it's not consistent. So that's one of the things they can't consistently guarantee that you're going to get X amount. So it's not labeled, but it is there. And a lot of that's because of the sulfuric acid that's used to treat the rock phosphate when they're processing it. And there's just a little bit of sulfur left over that it is being picked up. And that's one of the things that I did see in one of my studies um, that it is there. And that herbicides, um, that is really enough to do a whole lot of anything. And then irrigation water, um, that's one of the things if you have irrigation, I just, for interest sake, just see what you've got in there. I mean, most of the wells are probably going to have something. It's whether or not you've got a high level. That where they would tell me if I've got a lot of sulfur in my well, that I probably don't need to worry about an in-season application. I mean, really focus on your your availability early on when that time period where we can see some growth differences um, without sulfur if we're not irrigating. Keeping rates low, that's what we've done recently. I know some growers have really been pushing for higher and higher rates, but for us, you know, you'll see, I get some criticism on these low rates I use on it, but if I'm looking at sources, I have to have a low rate with it. And we've seen that. And that's one of the things nice about the current research that I've been able to separate out between some of these sources to look at availability. And then, you know, five, you know, talking to farmers, consultants, any of you out there, it's been kind of critical with a lot of this. Because again, I thought I kind of had a, a thing done and then I started talking to more people and said, okay, there's some areas we need to look at. And it just, you know, if you see anything interesting, it's kind of one of the things that, you know, it's always piques my interest to talk to growers to see what they're seeing, to look at, um, you know, different options. Because again, there's a lot of flexibility within this. And that's really the thing that's been nice with it is it hasn't been a one size fits all strategy. There's a lot of different options. It's just trying to tailor fit that option to fit best with your crop rotation, your tillage scheme is, is really what's been important. So Ryan, that's all I have. Uh, if you want to break okay. into some questions. <clears throat> Yeah, we have a number of questions coming in. Now, I'm kind of curious, you guys, uh, we know nitrogen is pretty dynamic in terms of landscape position effects and climate or weather variables. Uh, if you compare and contrast like sulfur versus nitrogen, you know, in terms of loss mechanisms and mineralization, are they similar or is it less dynamic in sulfur? Well, sulfur is a little bit different in that it's... Um... So we've got, um, it's a monovalent anion, um, nitrate is. So it's just got one negative charge. Sulfate's got, you know, two negative charges. And I don't know, I think that impacts it slightly in terms of how quickly it'll, it'll leach. I mean, it does seem to leach a lot slower, than, or at least, at least a little bit slower than nitrate. So it will hang around, uh, I think, a little bit better than, than nitrate. The other thing is with nitrate is, if you look at your wet and saturated soils, um, you know, sulfur and sulfate and nitrate both will be reduced. So like um, the reduction is what we call denitrification and nitrate. That's going to happen first though, realistically. So with sulfate, we shouldn't have as much of an issue. Although I do think our soils go through periodic reduction cycles with sulfate. And that's one of the reasons we see a lot of striping early in the growing season. I think it starts to reduce in the fall and, it, and then it starts to oxidize in the summer. And that's one of the things we're looking at right now with, um, some of the research we have just to try to see if we can track that um, and just see what's happening because it's, it's a dynamic system. And that's where, you know, really, I think the critical time period you look at most of our crops, particularly corn is that early season may uh, when we don't get a lot of mineralization, we may have some more reduced sulfur there is to get something out there because that's when we, we tend to see the issues come into play. And a lot of the fields in it tend to come out of it as, as sulfur starts to mineralize, but there are situations like the Waseca site, where we tend to see that striping hang on. And if you see that striping at V10, we've got an issue. We know that. I mean, if it starts to recover, uh, we know we can get some of that yield back. Um, but um, just, you know, we know there's a, there's a certain window in there where early in the season, we only need about five pounds of sulfur total uptake until we get to about that V10 time frame. So it doesn't take a lot, but that small amount is pretty critical when it comes to um, yield responses. Okay, so... Kind of along that same thread, then uh, we had one question that came in prior to the, the session about elemental sulfur. They name a particular product here, Tiger, Tiger Soul 90. <clears throat> and uh, the question is about does it get tied up in clay soils or is it the lack of oxidation? I, you know, there are questions about tying up in clay soils. Well, and I think a lot of it, and it's kind of what I was talking about before, if you bury it, it doesn't necessarily get tied up. But since element, the way that product is supposed to work, it's 10% bentonite. And bentonite is a clay that has a high shrink swell capacity. So as that pastille is what that little thing is called that you apply um, with the product in it, as it absorbs water, what it should do is it should puff up and it will fracture and it to disperse the material. 
The problem in these higher clay soils is you've got such a tight pore space in there that since it's hydrophobic, I mean, it just doesn't have a lot of capacity to swell and disperse that product. And the issue with elemental sulfur is oxidation. It's um, affected by moisture, temperature, then also the particle size. So it's kind of like lime in terms of the effectiveness of your, of your limestone. The smaller the particle size, the more quickly it'll be, it'll be um, oxidized uh, with, in case of elemental sulfur. And when you get those clumps in there, it just acts as one large particle and it will not release. And I think that's what's happening on a lot of our sites. So some of the new studies we have right now, we've been looking at repeated applications. I'm kind of wondering if repeated tillage, if we can break some of that stuff up that's already been in the soil, but it still seems like there's a lag there that um, we're not getting full availability with it. Um, the products like the MES line or those, um, the, the MST line that I'm using, those of uh, just having a lower concentration, um, they seem to have a bigger, that has a bigger benefit where you don't get that big clumping with it. And it just seems like it reacts better because uh, the MST it, itself, that product, I've been seeing similar availabilities are even better than our sulfate. So, you know, like MAP MST, which is a product I know that's, that's out there, seeing some positives of that. We've been using potash MST, which is another product they've been trying to develop. I wish they get that on the market because I think that works a little bit better and it's a really good think structured for alfalfa production if you want elemental sulfur in it with it but we're seeing some benefits at least with that it just it has all to do with that um it's not that it's tied up it's just kind of smashed in there and it can't um it can't oxidize very quickly and dan you have seen that uh elemental tiger 90 actually does better on coarse textured soils typically than it does on the medium and fines which supports that idea that it's related to the the hydrophobic nature of the of the water well, even at Rosemont, it looked like it did a little bit better than Wasika. And with, you know, having more porosity with that silt loam soil, I mean, it, it's not perfect, but it's still better than, um, yeah, and the, the sands. It, it was seeing sands, essentially, what we saw at Becker with this, this new trials, we saw a rate response, but no source response. So essentially, um, whatever source we used was fine. We just had to hit the optimal rate, which was, you know, 10, 20 pounds at that site. So kind of in the same thread here, uh, what about band applying AMS with P and K in the fall? Should be no reason that that isn't just fine to band it. The only, the only issue is you do have, you know, if you have a fair high rate of MAP or DAP, you got a fair amount of ammonium in there. But if it's putting on in the fall, even though it's below the seed or in the furrow, it shouldn't be an issue. Yeah, I mean, really the thing would be leaching potential of the soil. But most of if you're banding, particularly for strip till, if it's out western Minnesota, I don't worry about it as much. Um, but if you're putting on, you know, 20 pounds, 15 pounds, you probably have enough with that band where you have enough at least hanging around there. I mean, that'd be my only concern would be a movement of it. I mean, I don't think I'd be banding elemental, particularly Tiger 90 in there just because of some of the issues that we've had with it. So I think that's not the best way to apply that. I mean, so AMS would probably be your best option, you know, maybe gypsum. Uh, the other option would be, you know, if you have the planner option, you know, Jeff is showing some of the things we've been seeing with that planner banded ATS and you can do a lot with it. Um, you just can't really put anything in the furrow. I know there was one question on that in terms of what we call a safe rate. And I really am hesitant to say that any rate's going to be safe. I know, Jeff, you had a gallon and we've seen that a gallon or two in some of our demo plots that we haven't seen the stand reduction. But what I'd be afraid of is a year like last year where we had a lot of early planting dry soils. And I think that's where you're really going to see it come into play. And it's just not a risk, particularly with the, the high seed costs right now. If farmer wants to put some elemental in his, in his strip till band with his P and K, that's fine. But he has to realize he's going to have to have some ATS or some broadcast sulfate source on as well. He can't just rely on the elemental alone. Well, I think the micro essentials probably something like that. It's probably that, a better micro would be better. Yeah, it'd be a better yeah. option. And then what, what would you guys recommend for a person in that situation where, where they're coming back with the planner if they're using a rate of uh, fall applied band with their strip till, what do you need at, with planning? I would say a minimum of two gallons of ATS, which is five and a half, 5.6 pounds. Um, if it was corn on corn, I might feel better if you went up to, to 10 pounds, which is about three and a half gallons. But then the, the rate that's in the band would not have to be, you know, certainly wouldn't need 20 pounds or 25 pounds in the band. Okay, so Jeff, uh, we do have one uh, question here from someone that uh, we're, they're curious about the soil types that you're, you're farming there in Wasika. Yeah, so they're poorly drained, 
primarily Webster Nicollet clay loams, uh, anywhere from 4.5 to 6% organic matter. Um, deep soils, plenty of organic matter at all tiled range, as I said, that's pretty typical of the glacial till soils of South Central, Southwestern Minnesota and West Central, but generally acid uh, surface soil pHs. We do have some calcareous surface soil areas in low and in foot slope positions, but not as much calcareous soils as you see as you move to this uh, West Central part of the state. Okay, great. Um, <clears throat> so Dan, there's a question here about sulfur rates, um, continuous corn on very sandy soil, less than 1% organic matter, uh, but they're under irrigation. Uh, and it says here, are you getting that much sulfur through irrigation water? And maybe, maybe where do you, where do you determine how much sulfur you're getting from your irrigation water is probably a, 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 would be a good resource for someone asking this question. Well, I mean, if you're running a lab, if you're running your stuff through a lab, running nitrates, see if they can run sulfate on it. That's your best way to do it um, because it's going to vary somewhat, although the numbers have been relatively high. I mean, we've had, although we've been at, you know, where I've been doing most of my measurements have been at close to closer to Becker, where we've got the majority of them, although I've done some from around other areas too. They've um, all been, you know, where we've been at least putting on 20 pounds minimum uh, annually because we had a study back in... Um, Back in 2010 and 2011, I had a student looking at that where we're on different chunks of ground. We had some stuff south of the, the metro, kind of closer to the Cannon Falls area. And then we had some site in Hastings area. And then we had some sites up closer to St. Cloud. And they were all coming back at least 20, 25 pounds. So it's there's not going to be, I think, a consistent, um, unless, unless MDA has been tracking wells, they have a map of it to kind of show you kind of general and average. You just have to do it on, a, if you're running some of your water, just See if they could run sulfate on it. That's the best thing you're going to do with it. All right. So here's another question. Uh, how much carryover should we expect? In, in particular, it's someone working in Northeast where farmers typically are applying 50 plus units of sulfur with their nitrogen corn uh, or corn silage, sorry. Uh, and then small grain silage rotation. Is that enough or too much? Well, I don't think you need much more than about 20, 25 pounds because the, the problem, there was a question on removal I saw somebody had on there. I mean, your removal for corn soybean is going to be somewhere between probably, um, you know, eight to 15 pounds. It's usually, I figure 10 to 15. I usually figure close to 25 pounds total uptake, you know, for a corn production system. If you look at silage, so a silage system probably going to remove around 25 pounds total, but your soils aren't completely devoid. And that's kind of the thing that we've been seeing is, you know, 20 to 25 pounds. I, the study I had, um, we looked at, it was six years at locations where we had corn soybean rotations. We put 25 pounds on as AMS ahead of the corn. And I was picking up consistently after the second, third year of the rotation, we had, you know, five, six bushels where the beans were picking it up. And that was with only a 25 pound application there that we were getting enough carryover. Because I really think, I mean, most, most cases were probably only short about five to 10 pounds really is what we're doing. And the way that if you factor in most of these soils are going to mineralize it, whether you use it or not, it's kind of like nitrogen that, um, you know, over application, we're going to see some carry through. And with 50 pounds, the thing I'd really be concerned about with that is acidification. And that's one of the factors we're looking at right now um, with, I'm going to start looking at with some of these longer term trials is where my soil pH has been going, particularly in situations where we have ammonium sulfate, which is the most acidifying source of nitrogen, particularly the, of the sources that we apply. So the more you apply, and that's kind of one of the things I'm, I'm concerned about with both elemental sulfur and AMS may hasten the time you need, particularly in situations where you have to lime. And that's one of the things that I would be concerned about with these high application rates is really try to hone these in as much as close to what you need as possible. So you don't avoid, or you can avoid acidification. I mean, even with you're falling with small grains with like a silage situation, I don't think you need much more than 20 pounds, 25 pounds, um, particularly like Southeast. If you're dealing with soils that are around 2% organic matter less, I think that should be sufficient. Dan, I don't want to make this complicated, but I think there is a bit of a wild card when you look at these sulfur dioxide emission data from the last few years. The, the emissions have now got to the point where it is so low that it makes me wonder whether in the next five or 10 years, we're going to see the response become a little bit larger, even back to the, to the early 2000s when Giles and I started doing studies on sulfur, where we were still getting 
between five and eight or 10 pounds of uh, atmospheric deposition a year, the numbers now are like two pounds or less through most of the Midwest. And that could be the case, Jeff. I mean, I think that's been our main issue. I mean, uh, you look at, you know, people just attribute, well, the reduction right away, it's been a compounding issue. Because if you look at how these depositions have been made years and years and years, if it's been in excess of what that crop needs, essentially you're going to have sulfur or sulfate levels that are going to build over time. And then it's going to take a little time to draw those back down. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, it isn't out of the realm of possibility that we see it. I think though, with more growers applying sulfur in their fields, though, that's going to kind of probably make up for some of those depositions. So, you know, do I think we're going to need more than 25 pounds? I don't think so, because again, that's about the max uptake. I mean, I think, you know, 20, 25 pounds is probably about really, you know, critical for that. And then it's just going to be looking at isolated situations where potentially maybe that follow-up crop like beans, that if you're not directly applying it, you know, maybe we see more of an instance, we see response on that end from it. Maybe that more of that's being utilized, but um, yeah, it's been a compounding issue. That's, you know, it's not just a single, it's just been a lot of reductions in terms of what was going on for sulfur at one point in time, less manure, a lot of our pesticides had had sulfur in and this cutting all that out is over time compounded it down where we've seen these, these increased incidence of response. And we do have some soil differences when you get in the western, especially the southwestern extreme southwestern part of the state and into, the, into South Dakota, you'll have some soils that have free gypsum in the in the subsoil. So there there could be some potential sources of of sulfur in the in the soil itself in certain areas of the country or certain areas of our state and in the Midwest. And that's where the sulfur soil test will work. I mean, you can see high levels of it where you have gypsum, you're probably less likely and then to see some responses, although it's not out of the question because I think it's, there's some pH things that interact. So they so that's the stuff we're working on now. I mean, I'm really trying to see what's going on chemically in some of these soils over time to, but I mean, really for more and more what we're seeing is just growers are applying it in, I mean, I really can't blame them based on what we're seeing. I just don't think I would be, you know, if you're kind of on the fence where you think you need it or not, I don't think I'd be going much more than 10 pounds for a broadcast yeah, application. Exactly, Dan. And when I talked to, to farmers, I, I did a meeting out in South Dakota about sulfur a few years ago, and they said the same thing that they, they just needed in that early growth period that up to about V6, V7, V8. And then once the corn gets in that, uh, uh, rapid growth phase, it gets a better root system, then it, all the deficiency symptoms just disappear. And then they didn't need it after that, but it still, it still gave them that little bit of benefit early. So, so guys, what about a person that might be doing intensive alfalfa production, you know, kind of along those lines of removal and, and use, or is the probability that they got manure take care of that? Or I, I don't know, just kind of throwing that out there. I mean, intense production, if you're taking a lot of cuts off and I'll, I'll have some of that data once I get, we haven't had the total sulfur contents of the stuff that we do currently just to see how much total we're moving. It's more in the range of, I think around 30 pounds is what it is. But um, again, looking at the data, I mean, Max, I've had a site that we were higher yielding uh, study that I didn't show off of this that um, needed, we were doing seven and a half and 15 that needed 15. Actually, I didn't have anything higher than that. I could have used more. So usually intense production systems, I would say at least 20, 25 pounds. And if you're using elemental sulfur, I might even go higher than that because we've been seeing with Tiger 90 is, you know, roughly that the corn side of it, it was about 25% as available, which is a, which is kind of an issue though. If you're putting it on the surface, I think you may have a better option to get more availability there. So really with Tiger 90, I don't think I'd be skimping on the rate with it. Um, you know, I think you can get a little bit tighter on the rates with AMS. We might be able to get down to 15 pounds. Um, but um, that's kind of what we're seeing. I don't think it's really worth going much higher than that because I'd, I would focus on annual applications with alfalfa. So, you know, you look at, you figure it's going to be 30 pounds removal. It's not really worth going over 30 pounds. Okay, excellent. Uh, there's a question here about uh, a resource for they're wondering about a web or app resource for uh, calculating amounts that should be applied. Is our web page probably the best resource for that? Or do you have another tool? Well, that z.umm.edu uh, nutrient management um, is backslash nutrient management is kind of where we'd go. I mean, I've got all the recommendations there for now um, on it. Um, obviously it isn't catching everything because we're still working on some stuff with, with sources at this point. And in the majority of the recommendations right now I have are gauged either towards um, 
essentially sulfate sources or thiosulfate. I mean, thiosulfate is slightly different that um, it's a double bonded sulfur. So when it hits the soil, it'll form the elemental sulfur will be present and also sulfate. So you have, it's kind of a 50, 50 mix. It just, it oxidizes a lot quicker because it's, it's in the, it's in the atomic form when it does it, it's not in a big chunk. So we've seen good um, effect of that. So if you look at the recommendations are kind of geared towards both those two and elemental, we'll kind of see, I, like I said, some of these micronized or these co-granulated products, um, those I think will be fine. You can use the same recommendations. It's um, a Tiger 90, um, anything that's more of a, uh, just an elemental sulfur source that's flaked or it's bigger chunks, it's gonna be a little bit different. So you may wanna increase rate there. Okay, and I'll put a link to that resource in the chat uh, box uh, as we move along here. Um, so uh, we got another question kind of related to application. Uh, this person has been split applying AMS, 50 pounds pre-plant, 50 pounds top dress at V5. They've got very sandy or sandy loam soils with two to 3% organic matter. Would you judge that as a sufficient amount of sulfur? It should be. Yeah. I mean, you're talking about 24 pounds of sulfur there with hundred pounds of material. So I don't think you'd need much more. I mean, it, you, you'll tell, you'll know right away. I mean, the tops of the plants will start to, well, they do kind of yellow somewhat with corn. That's one of the things we're looking at right now because some hybrids tend to yellow a little bit more, but as long as you're not seeing the really stereotypical striping on it, um, you know, that's, that's the big thing, but I've, that's kind of, you know, we've used 25 pound rates and had good success with it. So, you know, that 50, pounds that split whatever that should be enough i would add that if it's in corn after beans it's probably more than adequate and if it's a, if it's in corn on corn uh, in high residue environments it's still adequate okay so another kind of question related to rate and application here uh they're currently variable rating uh 32 percent in an ats blend uh zero by two with the planner and they're very variable rating it based on soil organic matter. Uh, their blend is about 62% nitrogen to 38% sulfur. Uh, field averages are around 10 gallons of the blend, which is about 3.8 gallons of ATS. Soil organic matter, matter ranges from 3.5 to 7. I'm wondering if we should be applying more S uh, than what we are currently doing. Are they, what types of textures of soils? I, they said low organic matter. Are they coarse textured soils or are they silt loams? We're talking 3.7%. So that's, I mean, usually with that, I mean, around two gallons ATS should be adequate mm. with that. Um, the only thing with the seven and a half, if you'd have some high pH areas, that's kind of where we've seen where the rates need to probably go up. Um, and some of the, the lower you know, pockets, that's kind of, again, some of the research I'm looking at now, because I've seen some areas there that stripe really bad. And it looks like iron deficiency, but it's, I mean, it might be partly, but it's, it's when I applied sulfur, I've got some pretty sizable yield increases in there. So that's the only thing that I would look at with those high OMs. But again, the ATS, like Jeff was saying, two gallons, that's kind of roughly about what you're applying there. Um, it should be enough. I mean, it, it especially for, for anything above, you know, 3.7% organic matter. And in our corn on corn studies, we went to that three and a half gallons, which was about 10 pounds of sulfur, just because it matched the rates of our broadcast, our low broadcast rate. Um, but in, in our, in the many trials I've done in corn after beans, the two gallon rate was almost al always more than enough in, in a corn soybean rotation. Now, one thing I did notice, and this was done by Brian Lang in Northeast Iowa, who's an extension at Iowa State University is, he did a lot of work early on in the late 90s looking at, at, at rolling topography in southeastern Minnesota on the lust soils. And he would see either in both corn and in alfalfa, the lower landscapes where the organic matter content was a little bit higher would have very minimal sulfur deficiencies. And he'd get on the eroded knolls, as Dan mentioned at that field in Albert Lee, and, and the field looked really poor. And he'd get a very large yield response to just a modest rate of, and I believe at that time, Dan, I think he was using gypsum. I can't remember for sure, but, and that, that kind of is indicative of, I think what, what this grower is interested in is he's thinking that these knolls need a little bit more. And I don't think that that's a bad idea that it's probably correct. Okay. Uh, along those lines and more in relation to crop safety and with the seed here, we've got a person that's Asking about safety with four gallons of 1034 plus a gallon of ATS in furrow. Um, 
and they don't indicate here soil type and you know we can't predict the weather and environment i know that plays a huge role in this but what do you guys want to say about that in my opinion dan you can correct me that's not going to kill any corn but if it's a year like this last spring when it was dry and he's got some lighter soils in certain areas it might slow it down a little bit at the beginning until you get some moisture and get that diffusion or get that new, those nutrients. And it's primarily related to the ammonia that's in the ammonia polyphosphate and in the ammonia uh, or ATS. Yeah, I would agree. I mean, looking at the numbers, I mean, the, the official stance on it would be no, don't do it um, just because of the overall risk with ATS. Um, what I've seen is with heavier ground, it will, you know, somewhat reduce the root growth. Um, it, it may, hopefully it doesn't kill it. I mean, that's the big thing. If you put pulling plants and the radicals brown, that's a problem. Um, but, um, but yeah, it's just a question of whether or not it's enough. And, you know, if you're just kind of putting on because you think you need a little bit, you know, there might be a better option. That's kind of what I'm, I'm thinking here with it. And that's one of the things with starter, um, you know, Jeff's was showing some of that data with APP that, you know, if you're dealing with high soil test situations anyway just divert and go with a higher rate of sulfur but to do a two by zero placement put some nitrogen in i mean mm -hmm. you've got other options there uh, if you've got high ph soils and that's where you're looking at app that's a different story but because i know some growers are a little hesitant with the split band system that jeff was using with inferral plus the two by zero just because then you've got to figure out ways to more creatively hang tanks on your planter and your tractor so with all that that material but that's just the thing. Just look at what's the best option because sometimes, you know, the, the starter, particularly the phosphate starter, if you're taking care of that with a broadcast application, if you're wondering about, you know, what's a better option, you might be able to go with that surface band placement with some nitrogen and some sulfur and it might be a better option. So they said there's, there's not a one size fits all answer here. I, I agree with what Dan said just perfectly. I, I think if you don't have calcareous soils and you generally broadcast phosphorus and keep your soil test P in the high categories, um, you may be better just ignoring the, the inferral uh, 103040 or phosphorus nitrogen fertilizer and going with that surface dribble band and just putting nitrogen and eight or and ammonium thio in that band. And then uh, if you have corn on growing ground, that primarily all of that early growth and vigor effect comes from the nitrogen in the starter and not from the phosphorus anyway in corn on corn. Okay, and we had another question that I think you guys answered, so I'm going to dismiss that in relation to placement and such. Um, two questions kind of related to one another here. Uh, does sulfur enhance iron availability for plants in calcareous soils? And then there's another kind of common question down here about uh, hearing recommendations to put high rates of sulfur on IDC spots. So a lot of this has to, to deal with acidification. The issue that you're going to run into is the fact that these soils are high pH for a reason. I mean, it isn't like um, it's what we call buffering capacity, which is the resistance of the soil to change its pH, that it's so high in those soils that acidification just isn't going to be the most uh, cost effective strategy. And I know um, AgVice Labs did some out of North, uh, out of Northwood, North Dakota did something where they put on, I think, up to like 10,000 pounds or more of elemental sulfur and it dropped the pH. It was roughly around... Um, it was a little over eight. It dropped it by a couple tenths for about a year or so. But then after that, it was back up to where it was before. So it would have an impact if you could acidify those. Uh, the problem is the buffering capacity is so high that, you know, we just have to look at other ways to manage those. Um, because I can do it. You know, I, I'm North Metro. I, I've got sand up there that's poorly buffered. I can easily change my pH there. But uh, with the soils out west, with a lot of the carbonate, it's just really difficult to do. I mean, in theory, it would work, but it just isn't going to be a cost-effective strategy to get it to um, to change. I'll so add, we had a, I'll add the ahead. place where it does work is in uh, is around your home. If you want to plant an acid-loving plant and you got high pH soils around your in your garden or in your yard, um, if you dump a twenty-pound bag of elemental sulfur around that until it move or mix it into the soil where you're going to plant those blueberries or whatever acid loving plant you want, it will help establishment and it will help that plant thrive. Um, but Dan's right in, in a field situation, it doesn't work. 
Okay, so we had a comment question. I know we're getting a little bit long here. We're approaching that 10 o'clock time frame, but uh, for a person that's using dairy manure, uh, you know, maybe once upon a time that was sufficient. Is it still sufficient? Or do you need to look at how do you evaluate how much you need to augment uh, with, you know, fertilizer sources of sulfur in that, that scenario? So traditionally what we've been telling growers is if you can get a total sulfur analysis of your manure factor in around 65% first year availability. Now it depends a lot on what kind of dairy manure you have. If it's a liquid source, I think it's going to be similar like a pit manure in, in swine that I think there's a lot of hydrogen sulfide in there, which is more of a reduced form that isn't going to be readily available. Maybe a situation, I've had some consultants talk about that with um, swine manure situations about needing a little bit early on just to get things going. But that's kind of the question right now. If you're dealing with more of a kind of a scrape and haul type system where you have more organic matter in it, more solids, then I don't think you'd have much of a problem. I don't think there's going to be as much of an issue because I think that sulfur is going to be more readily available out of that type of system. It's just going to be kind of what you have. Again, um, I think that 65% probably works really well for that scrape and haul system, if not more. But we've just been using that right now because that's the best number I have in terms of that, because we don't have a good way to see what sources of sulfur are in there other than total sulfur, which doesn't give us the whole picture because not all that sulfur will be available. Yeah. And I would add, if the field is a, a field that is regularly getting manure, um, it's probably much less likely to need a sulfur fertilizer on top of it than a field that gets a one time, well, my neighbor's got some manure he wants to get rid of. That, that may not be enough in, you know, in, the, in the long term or even in that first growing season. But Dan's right. I think if you're going to put some on, put some on a little bit at the beginning, that five or 10 pounds, and then let the manure provide the rest. Okay, so there was another question. I think you guys covered this about the cost effectiveness or lack thereof of trying to adjust pH based on applying these sources. So I'm going to say that one we kind of covered. Um, so this one here is uh, they're looking at um, side dressing nitrogen V3, V4, and they're going to use ATS. And they're kind of curious, are they at risk of losing some yield uh, by not having that sulfur available at or ahead of planting? No, I don't think they'll lose any yield. And all the split application studies, Dan, I've done and you've done, I think if you get out there by V5, V6, you don't usually use yield, but it may affect the grain moisture just a little bit. Okay, and there was another question related to that, so we'll dismiss that. <clears throat> uh, maybe a quick comment or something uh, about uh, where the sulfur is coming from through or to get into the well water that, that we're applying. That I don't know. I mean, I don't, I can't prove that it's stuff that we're applying. I mean, it may just be naturally there. I mean, because I know, I mean, I grew up in Iowa, we didn't have sulfur being applied on ours and we had a lot of hydrogen sulfide already in our well. So, you know, it, I mean, I think some of it's natural, um, but um, you know, there might be some that's moving down into the aquifers from what's being applied since it is mobile. But um, I think a fair amount, particularly those high situations were, were there to begin with, to start with. All right. And then the one question that came in beforehand, uh, driving down magnesium with elemental sulfur. That I haven't tried. Um, I mean, I'm assuming, you know, you, you decrease the pH should decrease the availability of, you know, calcium magnesium um, just because they tend to be more available on high pH soils, but you'd have to have a way to leach them out. Um, so that would be the, the main thing is just to get, it'd be a way to get rid of them. So I don't know on that if, um, I mean, even if you would form magnesium sulfate in with high availability of uh, stuff there, I mean, that should be a, a salt. So I don't think it's really going to do a whole lot to do it. So it's going to be, I think more or less back to that pH adjustment issue, which is just, isn't really overly feasible. Yeah. And, and if they're, if their sole purpose is, is they're trying to get their potassium base saturation status higher by dr getting rid of magnesium, it, it's really not feasible and it's not going to be effective or have any impact really anyway. Okay. Excellent. Um, and then the last thing uh, I'm going to just mention here, our webinar recordings are available uh, typically early in the week following. So next Monday or Tuesday, by the time everything gets transcribed and, and, and put up onto the web. So uh, we'll call that one answered. Anything else you guys want to say 
The only other thing that does come into that I, I'm surprised hasn't been asked is that mixture of ATS with UAN and whether or not it has any impact on um, as a stabilizer. And it can act, um, I think it's got to be, a, I think, a, at least 3% of the total mix or higher. I can't remember. There's a, there's a minimum amount it has where it gives you some stabilization effect as a urease inhibitor. It's not a nitrification inhibitor, but it, it can act. It's not as good as agrotain or some of these other ones. So it, it maybe a couple days at best, it gives you some control or some uh, reduction in the conversion, but that one does come up, but there is a minimum with it. I just wouldn't necessarily count on it um, as my, my sole option, but I'm kind of surprised that one didn't come up because that's one that does come up um, quite a bit with that. So that's, I guess, one thing I was going to bring up before that I thought I'd just bring up is that it can impact as a urease inhibitor. It just isn't the most effective one. Yeah, Dan, I, I, I was, I was thinking of that too, but I, I think, I don't remember the exact number either, but I think the concentration has to be significantly greater than that. I was thinking it was like 10 to 20% that it needs to be, but that would be a normal ratio. Yeah, I think it is. I mean, normal ratios, most growers are using, I think it's, it's fine. I'd have to look back at it. I mean, maybe it's 30. I can't remember. I've got in our advanced nitrogen smart. I know I have that number in there, but I just couldn't pull it off the top of my head and I yeah, didn't have time to too. dig through my presentation. So there is some information on Jay Goose uh, from NDSU, the soil chemist now retired up there, did a lot of work with that. And I know he had some numbers where he had how much it had to be to, to be effective to um, do anything. But again, it isn't going to be as good as, as some of these other, other sources, um, particularly like a source like Agritain. So one last question that came in late here, and then we're going to wrap it up here. Uh, sulfur and uh, winter rye on sandy soils is you got any feel for what you might need there? So with small grains, we've done this with sandy soils. With irrigation, um, you know, I've only needed roughly, um, this is with spring wheat, we've needed roughly around 10 pounds in max, I mean, 10 to 15 pounds. I mean, you could put some on as a starter to get it going. I doubt you'd need much more than that. But if it is a non-irrigated sand, um, you know, I think 15 would be enough. So if you're looking at it, you know, maybe 50 pounds AMS, somewhere in that range, um, we'd probably be no more than you need. Small grains, it hasn't been as consistent um, for responders as um, like wheat. Um, I haven't done any work with rye. Um, I can't remember if we did some work with winter wheat. That's kind of a proxy. I don't think so. But the, yeah, the spring wheat data was the only site we saw a response was our sandy piece of ground. And that was an irrigated site. And it was again, roughly 10 to 15 pounds on that. So again, I think, you know, minimum 50 or 50 pounds of AMS would probably be sufficient. That does bring up one thing I'd mentioned, Ryan, is that uh, as we see the proliferation of cereal rye as a cover crop, I think that getting some sulfate sulfur near the corn row following cereal rye, if it had a very good biomass might be pretty important. Yeah, we hey. saw that, so. Good scraping. cautionary tale for, for, you know, when we're trying these new practices, we might have other adverse impacts with some of our nutrient needs. So good to point that out. Um, well, I do want to thank everyone for participating today and, and helping drive the discussion. I did put a link in there to the, the website where we've got crop specific nutrient needs. Uh, you should be able to link to, to other information there with uh, looking for rate recommendations and such. Um, with that, I do want to thank our, our sponsors, both the Minnesota Soybean and Minnesota Corn uh, Research Promotion Councils for helping facilitate today. Uh, and with that, we look forward to seeing you guys or seeing folks back next week, uh, nine o'clock on Wednesday. Uh, we're going to have a discussion on weed management. So thanks to everybody. <laughs>